Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Exodus. The Old Testament book of Exodus in Exodus and chapter number 35. Exodus and chapter number 35. We are continuing with our series of the life and ministry of Moses. And the specific place that we're at now is that the children of Israel under the leadership of Moses have arrived at Mount Sinai. It is there that God gave them the law and he gave Moses the plans for the tabernacle. And now we saw this morning as they gathered the supplies for the tabernacle that God used his people to supply for the tabernacle and... Now there's some final instructions about a specific person that God is going to use to be the head of the construction of all of the items in the tabernacle. And so if you wouldn't mind taking your copy of the word of God and turning with me to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35 and notice with me starting at verse number 30. Exodus chapter 35 starting at verse number 30. Notice what the word of God says. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezeel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. And to devise curious works to work in gold and in silver and brass and in the cutting of stones to set them in the carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Ahabalim the son of Hissamuk of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart. To work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and fine linen and of the weaver even of them who that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. And if you're the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a name that God appoints to be the head of putting together a crafting this tabernacle? And notice with me in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30 and notice the name Bezel. Bezel. (laughs) So I'm working on the pronunciation. Bezalel. Bezalel. And his name is In the Shadow of God. And so we'll use that as a title. His name, Bezaliel. And the, his name, which means In the Shadow of God. In the Shadow of God. Bezaliel, In the Shadow of God. And we'll do a character study on this man today. If you don't mind, let's go once again and talk to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And Lord, this is an important message. Lord, this could be a life-changing message. This is a message that everyone needs to hear either for the first time or be reminded of the importance of the lessons that we see in the life of Bezeel. I'm asking that you would just give us help. Lord, as I come to you, I reckon myself dead. I die to my desires, my ambitions, my goals, my things that I want to see accomplished. I give them to you. And then I ask that you fill me with your precious spirit for the purpose of being used by you to get your work accomplished in this specific case for the preaching of your word. And I'm asking that you would give us an understanding that I cannot give. I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would reach out and speak to people's hearts to illuminate them in ways that I could not. I find myself dependent upon you right now. And I'm asking that you would do a work. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Now, we know that there are several different ways to study the Bible. You could study the Bible by its books. I love to study the books of the Bible, to take the Bible and to go through the books of the Bible. You could study the Bible by its topics, and there's great topics of the Bible. You could study the topic of of hell. You could study the topic of angels. You could study the Bible by its themes, like the great theme of redemption. There is a scarlet thread of redemption that is woven throughout the pages of Scripture. And the golden strand of Christ's second coming, woven throughout the Scriptures. And it's fun to pull those threads. You could study the Bible by its words. And remember that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. And the Bible talks about how He inspired the words plural, not the word in general, but each and every word is what God has given us. You could study the Bible also by its characters. I love character studies. To be able to take a life of someone and to examine it. Remember, everyone's life teaches a message, even yours. There's people who teach a message of what not to do, and there are people that teach a message in their life But every person's life teaches a message. And so as we examine here, we see that God has pulled this man aside for a specific purpose. And we want to see some characteristics from this man's life that we would like to study tonight and pull into our own lives. The very first thing I'd like to show you about this man, Beaziel, is that he was, first of all, he was filled with a spirit. He was filled with with the spirit. Now, it is a wonderful name to be called in the shadow of God. Here it's not talking about that God is overshadowing him, but it's carrying the idea here that God is covering and protecting him. That it is God that is over him. It is God that gets the paramount in his life. And we can see that when he is filled with the Spirit. Notice with me, if we don't mind, in verse number 30. And Moses said, Unto the children of Israel, see the Lord hath called by name Beaziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him, so God hath filled him, Beaziel, with the Spirit of God. What we see first of all is that he is filled with the Spirit of God. Of God. Now, this is such an important idea to understand the filling of God's Spirit. You know, sometimes when we talk about the uh, filling of the Spirit, some people get a misunderstanding. Sometimes they feel like to be filled with the Spirit is only for preaching. So, what happens? Some people say, Well, I'm going to be filled with the Spirit and then I'm going to preach. And then because God didn't ask them or call them to do it, it falls flat. And they go, Well, it didn't work, so forget it. There are some people who say, well, being uh, filled with the Spirit only has to do with preaching. And since I'm not going to preach, it doesn't apply to me. And they miss out on God's blessing, on what God wants them to do. You understand, being filled with God's Spirit is for every aspect of our life. Not just for preaching, but for going to work. For raising children. I can't imagine any person that needs to be filled with the Spirit more than a mother. Well, first of all, so you don't drown the little rat. But also to be able to deal with them. To raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There is one thing that we understand in our life. We can not do God's work ourselves. You say, I can't do God's work. Then why am I here? What are we doing? No, 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 no. You can't do God's work himself, but God can do his work through you. This is part of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're filled with God's Spirit for two specific reasons. For service and for testimony. Service and testimony. To be able to do God's work no matter where you're at, that requires God to do his work. You're just the instrument. But also for testimony. All of us, every single one of us, have gone to the place where we tried to work, uh, live our life on our own, and we messed everything up. Because our temper can only last so much, and we're done, and we're blowing up at someone. 
Our patience only goes so far and we can't do it anymore. Our emotions can't handle anymore and we break down. We can't live the Christian life and we'll ruin our testimony in just a couple seconds what it took 30 years to build. So we understand being filled with the Spirit is for two purposes, for service and for testimony. And that covers every aspect of your life. Because you, if you are going to work in order to do your job competently and well, and to do it in such a way that you could reach others, you need to be filled with God's Spirit, not just for preaching. In order to have the testimony to deal with the crazy people that's around you, you can't do it yourself. You know, one of the mistakes that we make so often is that we try to solve spiritual problems in secular manner. This is a part of it I'll give you for free, but let's say that someone is stuck on pornography. You understand that's a spiritual matter. Someone is watching something they're not, and they're addicted to it, and that addiction is real. And you know how most of the time we try to solve a spiritual problem such as that? By our own will. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to look. I'm not. And we fail. Now I could use that because, because we could relate to it. But your spiritual problems so often you try to solve in your own power. And you're frustrated because it doesn't work. Because you can't do it. I'm trying to tell you right now. Here is the news. You can't do it. But God can. And he wants to use you to do it. So when we understand. We're talking about a man here. Who is not a preacher. He is not getting up. And preaching messages. Let me tell you that he's not even teaching the law. You know what he's doing. What we would call a secular job. He is a tradesman. He is working with his hand. It's the same equivalent of a welder. Of a carpenter. Of someone who. It's someone who's working a job. And doing it for the glory of God. And still needed to be filled with God's spirit. So what I'm trying to tell you now. This message applies to all of you. All so often, when something is talked about being filled with the Spirit, that immediately people tune out and say, well, it's not for me, it's nice, any preacher that listens to you. I'm saying this message is for every single one of you. We must be filled with the Spirit. So, now we got to define our terms. What do we mean? We have to define clearly. What we know to be filled with the Spirit is a deliberate choice. You don't get filled by the Spirit by accident. We also have to understand that being filled with the Spirit is different than the other Holy Spirit ministries. Most of the Holy Spirit ministries that deal with us are a once for all type thing. They're sovereign acts. The indwelling, the baptism, the sealing, the earnest, the gift of the Spirit. So the indwelling of the Spirit, the the baptism of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit, the earnest of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit are all once and done acts. What do I mean by this? When someone comes to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, meaning that they recognize that they're a sinner, and because of the, their sin that they've offended a, a holy, righteous God, then they realize that Jesus died for them, and they come to the place where they personally ask Jesus to be their Savior. The moment that happens, you become what the Bible says, born again. What does that entail? Is that just a fancy word? What happens is that the Holy Spirit who is in God comes to indwell within us. And we become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's the indwelling. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell within us. We get all of the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get at that time. But the Holy Spirit doesn't get all of us. Meaning that you don't have to get any more of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls that the indwelling of the Spirit. It also calls that the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit happens the point in time action that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't happen at water baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't come from some specific act. 
Baptism in the Holy Spirit comes at the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are immersed with the Holy Spirit. You get all of it. Again, these are all terms that are referred to in the Bible and I'll talk about it. It talks about the sealing of the Spirit. The moment that you get saved, you are sealed with the Spirit. You have God's seal, God's guarantee that He's going to keep His promise and He's going to take you to heaven. It's the earnest of the Spirit the book of Ephesians talks about. Earnest is like a a down payment. And the Holy Spirit is God's down payment to us that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. If you need more information, go to the Ephesians series that we've preached before. And we take a lot of time for this. But the filling of God's Spirit is a totally different act. And it's not once and for all. Now, when we talk about filling of the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Well, the filling of the Spirit is conditional because it depends on our cooperation with the indwelling Spirit. Meaning that we get all the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get, but the Holy Spirit doesn't get all of us. Maybe I could give an example. Let's say that I wanted to take this water bottle. Let's say that I had a cup. i just use a different thing. <laughs> and inside of the cup, I had... a little bit of Mountain Dew in it. And I want to fill this cup up with milk. So what I do, if I put milk inside of the cup, what do I get? Well, I get milk dew. It's not all milk. You understand? So in order to be filled with milk, I first have to empty the cup of its contents. There's an emptying. So now it could be filled completely up with milk. Now that's a crude illustration, but it applies here. In order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I have to be emptied of myself. We use a term like this called dead to self. I have to be dead in order for the Holy Spirit to have control. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to try to take the wheel. I'm going to try to take charge. Now, you say, well, what do you mean by dead? What I mean by dead is dead. Let's say, for example, we had a horse. And I don't know how we got a horse on the stage, but let's say that we had a horse here, and it's dead. That's a big, heavy horse, by the way. Probably had Max carry it. And we had this horse here, and... If I took time to elbow drop this horse, would it feel it? No. If I got down and I petted it, would it feel it? If I shouted at the horse, get up, horsey, would it respond? What if I said, pretty horsey, would it respond? No, because it is dead. In order to be filled with the Spirit, I have to be dead to self. Dead to my ambitions, my goals, my desires, what I want to get accomplished. In order to be filled with the Spirit, I have to be dead to self. Dead to both compliments and complaints. It is no longer about me. It is about God. By the way, this is the hardest place to start because our flesh wants to live. It wants to live. It's alive. And that's the problem because the indwelling or the filling of God's spirit is dependent upon our cooperation. And our flesh will not cooperate. And you give it a second, that flesh will come back and it will take charge again. And you're no longer filled with the Spirit. You're, the Spirit's no longer in control. You are. And so what we have is a struggle that's going on and we have to die. So in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a couple things that have to be in there. First of all, we have to die to self. We've already explained that. You have to die to self. You Die to your ambitions, your goals, your desires. In addition, you have to be clean. You have to be clean. What do I mean by this? It means that there has to be no unconfessed sin between you and the Savior. You need to be as thoroughly right with God as you know how to be. In fact, that often it says, God, show me. I give you permission to show me anything that needs to be dealt with. Because like any old house, there are some dark corners That if we took a flashlight, we would find all the dust and the cobwebs and all the stuff. Move the rug. 
Well, God knows where all those stuff is at. Even the stuff that we ignore because we're used to it. God could point it out. And we have to be thoroughly right with God. Another thing, in order to be dead to self, in order to be uh, uh, filled with the Spirit, we also have to be willing to be obedient to whatever He tells us. If there is something in your life you refuse to do, you cannot be filled with the Spirit. I cannot stress that enough. You cannot be filled with the Spirit. I don't care what you say, preacher. I'm not showing up to Sunday school. Then you cannot be filled with the Spirit. Let me tell you, preacher, I don't need to read the... Then you can't be filled with the Spirit. Well, preacher, I don't mind going to church. I don't mind going to Sunday school. But let me tell you, I'll never be a missionary. You cannot be filled with the Spirit. If there is any line in the sand you've ever drawn, if there's anything that you refuse to do for the Lord, you cannot be filled with the Spirit. Now, by the way, these are big things, but I'm not trying to make them impossible. I'm trying to say that our flesh resists it, but you can be filled with the Spirit. You can be dead to self. Especially when you first start, it takes some work because you're not used to dying to self. You're used to being in control. Just like everything else in the Christian life, you get in the habit of dying to self. You get in the habit of being filled with the Spirit. Habit of surrendering to God. This is why Paul said, I die daily. The great apostle Paul said, in my body there is a struggle. The great apostle Paul says, guess what? Every day I have to put this stinking rotten flesh to to death. Because otherwise I'll mess everything up. And by the way, as you go through the book of Acts, there are some times that the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, messed up and did things in his flesh. And he talked about it and regretted it later on. And the Apostle Paul is struggling. Now again, I'm not trying to say it's impossible, but I'm trying to say it's not as easy as, Woohoo! Look at me! All right? There is some work to it. By the way, something else in order to be filled with the Spirit, you must ask. There's a purposeful thing. You must ask. Lord, the best I know how I surrender myself to you, please fill me with your Spirit. Now, I'm not saying there's any magic words, but I do have to say you have not because you ask not. To be filled with the Spirit is not an accident. It is on purpose. It is a deliberate, purposeful act. It is, comes from emptying ourselves, dying to our ambitions, our goals, our things. Making sure we're thoroughly right with God. Making sure there's nothing in our life that we will not obey. We must yield ourselves and ask and allow God to do with us however He sees fit. May I also remind you as we're talking about being filled with the Spirit... Is that you cannot be a spiritual person without first being a scriptural person. You cannot be a spiritual person without first being a scriptural person. Now that comes at different angles. First of all, if you're not in your Bible, you cannot die to self. You don't have enough spiritual strength in you to die to self. Remember... There's a tug of war going on and which, between your spirit and the flesh. And the one that you feed the most is what's going to win. And so if you have not been in your Bible, you will not be spiritually strong enough to die to self. Your flesh is too strong. So first of all, if you're not in your Bible, you cannot be filled with the spirit. It's impossible. Second of all, if you don't go within the bounds of scripture... You cannot be filled with the Spirit. Now, (laughs) what I'm saying there is you say, Bless God! I'm filled with God's Spirit! And then you do something that God says don't do. That's not the Spirit that's controlling you. You cannot be a spiritual person without being a scriptural person. Now, to be dead to self is so important. And yet, one of the things that we struggle with because our flesh likes to live. Say, how can I tell that I'm dead to self? Well, can you sing? Can you sing? 
Can you sing to the Lord honestly when everything is going wrong? Can you rejoice in the God's character and who God is? You're not rejoicing and saying, look at how wonderful my life is when your house is burning down behind you. That's not what we're talking about. What we're saying is that when everything's falling apart, God is still good and God is still right. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. To be able to say God's still good and God's still right when things are not working out. You know, going along with those things, can you thank God for everything? Can you thank God for everything? Count your many blessings, name them one by one. If you are in a place where you said, I can't think of anything to thank God for, you are not dead to self. You have to be able to thank God for everything. Now, as we go back to here, we're talking about being dead to the self, and we're talking to about a man who is not a preacher. He's a laborer. He's working with his hands. As my dad said, it's real work. To be able to do real work with your hands, the carving, the mechanics of it, to put it together, the physical labor. And here is a man that is filled with a spirit. Notice what this filling of the spirit does in his daily life, in his job, as he's going to be tasked with putting together the tabernacle. Notice with me in verse 31. And he, that's God, hath filled him, Beaziel, with the Spirit of God, notice this, in wisdom, in wisdom. The word wisdom in this case here deals with the idea of skill. You know, there are some people who are great at different things. There are some people who can look at an electronic circuit path like a max. And he could look and he could trace it and say, you know what? This is where it's at. Where some of us could look at a schematic and say, look at all the squiggly lines. I don't know how this works. There are some people that could have that skill of doing it. There are some people that are skillful in playing piano that you know, I've taken piano lessons. I've tried to, I could do one hand, I could do the other hand, but to do them together and then follow all the nice squiggly notes, that's I, not going to happen. You know, different people have a skill for it. This is the wisdom. They have the skill to do the job that God has set before them. And by the way, the Holy Spirit can give us wisdom or skill in a job that goes beyond ourself. For example, I worked in the medical career field. And in the medical career field, uh, we had to run tests. We had to do things. We had to deal with patients. Even something as simple as a blood draw. You know, <laughs> it's not as easy as just sticking a needle wherever you want. But you have to find it. You have to know how to do the vein. You have to be able to do it. You have to be skillful. And there are times where you say, God, I can't do this. Everybody else has tried to look at his arm. Maybe something of trying to run a test. A medical test. And you're saying, all right, I need wisdom. I need to make sure, because lives are at stake. If I mess up, someone could die. A decimal place is such a big deal inside of a lab field. You take a, a carpenter. He's going to build a house. And he goes, you know, I think the board needs to be about this big. And you understand it takes skill to be able to see things and put it together. And the Holy Spirit can give us the wisdom beyond ourself to see something done. And we need that because we all realize we have limitations and we fall short. And we're not smart enough, knowledgeable enough, competent enough to be able to do the job that's set before me. But they've asked me to do this. I have to get it done. God can help. God can do this. He can give wisdom. Notice again verse 31. And he filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom. Notice this. In understanding. This understanding here carries the idea in this context why it needs to be done. You know, there's plenty of things that we do that you do in your job that you do it and people say, why in the world do you do it this way? Why even do that? And you're saying, this is so vital and important. You have to do it this way. You have to do this one step. You can't skip it. So you know the why. You know, that's very important too to understand not only what to do, but why you're doing it. The Holy Spirit can give you that and help you in your job in working with things, raising kids, working with uh, 
kids, working at your job, doing the labor, doing your job competently and well to be able to have this. Notice this, verse 31, and he had filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge. The word knowledge here is the technical know-how. So you have the skill to do it, you know why to do it, but also the technicality of how to do it. <clears throat> um, for example, someone had made this board for me years ago, and I'm thankful for it. Um, we had a missionary come and take a look at it, and he says, oh, usually boards are so, f wow, and he started wiggling, this is so sturdy. And what happened? Someone had the skill to put it together in such a way that it doesn't shake apart. It doesn't, you know, there was a technical know-how to be able to perceive what problems are going to have and to put it together in the way that it ought to go. But notice this too in verse 31. And he had filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding in the knowledge and all manner of workmanship. In the context here, this carries the idea of knowing how to work. Knowing how to work. May I also kind of put a plug in here? Many people know how to be busy. Very few people know how to work. Okay? We all know people who are paid to hold up shovels. Right? You see them in construction season. That's their full-time job is to hold up the shovel. And they're doing a good job with it. I mean, we could save them money and put up their own shovel holder. Right? I'm making jokes, but we all understand. You all have people at your job that are very busy but get nothing accomplished. This, to be filled with the God's Spirit, enables you know how to work. To be, get a lot of things accomplished. One of my favorite people in history is Erasmus. I love Erasmus. We'll talk more about him in about two years. Erasmus, outside of the Apostle Paul, was probably the most intelligent person and most intelligent man who walked this earth. Erasmus was used to go and find every scrap of Greek and Hebrew paper to prove that every verse in the Bible belong there. That's pretty amazing. But that's not all he did. He went to the um, Museum of London. I'm not having the right title. It's up in London. Miss Nancy will correct me later. It's still there today. And even if you looked at the, the books of who cataloged these things... Even today, hundreds of years later, the man who cataloged most of the items there was Erasmus. Erasmus. And they said that he can get eight months' work done in eight days. Because he knew how to work. And that came from the Spirit of God. There is a difference between being busy and being effective. In work. And the Holy Spirit can help you do that in your job. You say, well, that doesn't sound like fun to me. I don't want to work more. Well, you understand, God designed us to work, and work is a blessing of God, not a curse. And if you're going to be filled with God's work, the reason why He's filling you with the Spirit is not to stand there and look pretty. Amen. He He's filling you with the Spirit to get things accomplished. Does that make sense? And so here is a man who is not a preacher. He's not even a Bible teacher. He's a worker, yet he's filled with God's Spirit. And God is going to use this man to do something for the Lord using his hands and the skills that he has as God is directing him. And I want to encourage you that everyone in the sound of my voice, you need to be filled with the Spirit. Tomorrow's Monday, you've got to go to work, and you don't have to dread, uh, dread going to work, but instead you could die to self, say, God, I want you to use me as an instrument at my work. You use me how you see fit, die to self, ask God to be filled with the Spirit, make sure you're as right with possible, make sure there's nothing you're not going to be disobedient to, and then God can use you at your work to see things accomplished. You know what students need? You need to be filled with the Spirit so you can learn what God has given you to do, so you can have the wisdom, so you can be effective, so you can understand. 
all of us have been student at one time and the teacher talked and we said, we have, our eyes are wide and said, we have no clue what just said. Well, you know, God can decipher. God can give us understanding. God can make things click and understand being filled with God's spirit even as a student. You understand, there's not an area of our life where God doesn't want to use us to teach us to, for us to be effective in serving Him in every aspect of our life. But that's not the only principle we learn from Beaziel. Not only was he speared with a fear, uh, filled with a spirit, but notice this, he was commanded to teach. He was commanded to teach. Notice with me in verse 34. And he hath put in his heart, so God hath put in his, Beaziel heart, that he may teach, both he and then his assistant that would teach him. Notice this, that he is going to teach him. And them hath he filled with the wisdom of heart, again talking about the spirit and putting together the work. But notice this, God had put in Beaziel's heart that he may teach. Notice this, the next nine months, they're going to be constructing the tabernacle. For the next nine months, they're going to be building, putting things together. And if he is a normal person, not filled with the Spirit, I've got a job to do. I want everyone out of my way. Just let me do it myself. Does that sound familiar? But you know what God said? While you're putting it together, I also want you to teach uh, someone else what you're doing. I want you to teach someone else how you're doing it. I want you to teach someone else why you're doing it. I want you to impart the things that I've given you and put it in someone else. He was commanded to teach. Teaching someone else. Now notice it wasn't you do the tabernacle then teach. It's while you're doing it. The next nine months you're busy. You're putting it together. But I also want you to teach. He commanded to teach. Which we see this principle found in the Bible. May I show you this principle in the Bible in a couple of passages? Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 2. If you've been at this church for any stretch of time, you are familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because I repeat it over and over and over. Why? Because this is the heart of God. For us not to just keep it to ourselves, but to teach others also. Notice with me 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to his son Faith Timothy. And Paul is giving Timothy a commandment. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. So he says, the things that I taught you. Among many witnesses, other people have heard me teach you these things. Notice this, the same commit thou to faithful men. May I also say that things that are different are not the same? I want you to teach the same thing I taught you. The very same thing I taught you. I want you to teach, commit thou to faithful men who shall teach others also. We notice that there are four groups of people here. There's a Paul who taught a Timothy. Timothy is expected to get faithful men, not unfaithful men, people who are going to be obedient, people who are going to learn, people who are going to be faithful in the things that they do, with the expectation that those faithful men are going to teach others also. So Paul, while he's doing what God has given him to do, has also been teaching Timothy. Now that Timothy is taught, he has the expectation that, Timothy, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to teach someone else the things I taught you with the expectation that you're also teaching them that they need to teach others also. We see this principle here. But as we're going with the idea here, a spirit-filled man who is not called to preach, who is not teaching a class, doing a regular job, notice the New Testament also covers this. Notice with me in the book of Titus, the next book over, Titus chapter 2. And as Paul is giving to his other son of the faith, Titus, he's giving him instructions dealing with the aged women and the younger women. Notice with me in Titus chapter 2, starting at verse number 3. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. 
Notice that. How is the only way that we're going to behave holy? You cannot do it yourself. You're going to fail. So we also have the, the undercurrents that they are dead to self and filled with the Spirit. The aged women, likewise, that they behave as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things, that they, these aged women, may teach the younger women. So here is an old, aged woman who have learned to walk with God, learn to die to self, learn to be filled with God's Spirit. They're ladies, not preachers, ladies. And they are expected at the same time to teach younger women. What are they to teach younger women? Notice in verse number four, that they may teach the younger women to be sober. This carries the idea to be serious. Now, may I pause here? There is many young mothers out there who are trying to do the best they can with what they know, and they're struggling horribly. You understand that God never designed it, especially for the believer community. The aged women are supposed to take the younger women and say, let me help you. And first of all, they're teaching to be sober. This idea of sober carries the idea of serious. We all know young mothers, young married, maybe they're not mothers yet, newlyweds, or in a relationship who are not taking it seriously. And we can see where things are going. Oh, they're taking it lighthearted. It's not that big of a deal. I could do whatever I want. He has to, do, you know, they're not taking it seriously. Maybe they're not taking motherhood seriously. They're not seeing the responsibility they have of taking that young person and raising it for the Lord. Notice in verse 4, that they may teach younger, young women to be sober, to love their husbands. Notice this, they have to be instructed on how to love their husbands. Well, some lady who may not be full of discernment, what do you mean I have to love my husband? My heart beats. I look at him and I swoon. What do I have to learn? You have to learn that he is a scumbag. And that you have to take care of him anyways. The idea of love is a commitment, not a feeling. How do I put up with him when he puts his socks everywhere how do I put up with him when he comes home from work and he's grumpy you know you have to be taught to, how to love your husband so she doesn't try to strangle him in the middle of the night and stuff him with a pillow or get so frustrated that she leaves the relationship how many young mother or young newlyweds don't last that long because they don't know how to love their husband. The feeling runs out. The twiddle pateness a nice Disney word, goes away. Their eyes are no longer blinded and they see him as he truly is. And go, what did I marry? How do I deal with this? I got to wake up with this. Remember, all guys put on, everyone puts on a salesman version. When you're courting, he takes a shower. He puts on deodorant. He smells his shirt before he puts it on to see if it smells clean. And then you marry him and he stops doing these things. And you go, what happened? What happened? Well, young ladies need to be taught how to love their husbands. That is something that an older woman is supposed to teach a younger woman. And we wonder why relationships are struggling because we're not having spirit-filled ladies who have learned to walk with God take younger women and disciple them to teach them these things that are necessary. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You say, but I have this little baby in my hand and oh, look at how cute he is. and Oh, I will love him forever until he screams for 24 hours and doesn't stop until he learns to lie to you and thinks he's getting away with it. Until he pops that attitude towards you and you want to put him. Mark Twain said this, that when you get a teenager, you need to put him in a box full of holes. When he becomes 18, you plug up the holes. Uh, so that was a lost man's response to it. You understand? you got to be taught how to love your kids, 
How to love your husband when they're unlovely. That doesn't come naturally. And this is the responsibility of spirit-filled ladies who have walked with the Lord, who the respond not preachers, not Bible teachers, everyday people, ladies who have been filled with the Spirit, taught to walk with God, and have the responsibility to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. In the Facebook age, there are some older women who need to get a hold of these younger women and say, that's not appropriate to put on Facebook. That's not appropriate to go tell all your girlfriends on the phone. Someone needs to grab a hold of these ladies now, and it's not the preacher's responsibility. A spirit-filled lady is supposed to take a younger woman and to teach her how to be discreet. You don't have to tell every problem that your husband has. And he can have a whole list of them. To the whole world. To learn to be discreet. May I give an example? My wife and I were newlyweds. And she got invited to one of those gossip. I mean candle parties. And they got together and. Next thing you know, all the ladies were talking about how horrible their husbands were. Well, my wife had just been married a month, two, maybe three. Hasn't been enough to pop the bubble yet. All right, she's still twiddle pated. She has another newlywed who's been married just a couple more months than her. And they found themselves jumping in the conversation and talking about how horrible their husbands are. And they're newlyweds because it started to catch. My wife, as they were driving home, said, you know what? What we did was wrong. And she made a purposeful determination right then and there that she'll never say anything bad about me in public. You know how much that's helped our relationship? Tremendously. Now, I'm not perfect. Not by any stretch of the imagination. You said, oh, I wonder what it would be like to live with pastor. Your worst nightmare, more than likely. I meant, I meant, I ask you how your Bible reading is. How would you like to have it every day? How's your Bible reading? How's your prayer life? Hey, can you take care of this? The responsibility of also finding out when is she my wife and when am I pastor? You know, those are two different things. Listen, I didn't ask for an opinion there. I'm pastor. I need you to get this done. I mean, she's got a hard job. And, but... She never complains about it. She never talks about all the stupid decisions. There's been many that I've made. And she, uh, I'm not trying to just promote her. I'm trying to say what happened is that she grabbed some discernment. And she actually takes that and tries to teach younger women, especially when they're married. Let me tell you something that's going to help your relationship. To be discreet. You don't need to tell everything that's wrong with your husband to the world. It's not going to help. There are some things that you don't need to promote. No, some things that you don't need to advertise. To be discreet. Notice this. Chaste. There's some things that you need to do in controlling your own mind. May I also kind of hit this thing? Daytime soap operas are not worth watching. You know what happens? You watch that long enough and you start to get dissatisfied with your own husband. Those daytime soaps... They're big eyed and then the feeling goes away and now I'm going with this guy and I ruin this relationship and I do this. If someone watches that enough, they start looking at their good for nothing husband and say, you know what, I can do something better. And they'll try to find something else. That's what those daytime soaps teach. You understand there are certain things that ladies should not watch or participate in. There are certain novels they should not read. It may be popular. Because you want to guard your mind and guard your relationship. You don't want to do anything that's going to cause you to start looking at him any worse than you may already look at him. He's got enough flaws. He doesn't need any help by the world to change your view on him. To be chaste. Keepers at home. You know how many young ladies have never been taught how to be a keeper at home? 
how to make a house a home. That's part of a responsibility. To make it so it's livable. You know, if men have our, our way, we have man caves. Nothing on the walls, maybe a deer head. We still using banana crates and milk carton things. We're fine. You got to make it livable. But there's also a thing that there's this thing of being able to keep the home up. You say, why doesn't the man help? The man should help, and that's a different topic. But you know how many ladies say, you know what? I don't have to work anymore. My husband's taking care of me. And then they sleep till noon and stay in their pajamas all day. And nothing gets done. Nothing gets accomplished. They're wasting away. And then they complain, I've got to make supper. I'm not trying to put different roles. Men should help. That's a different thing. Men should be good helpers. And they should get the whole family involved. But there's an idea of making a house a home. And that's not the preacher's responsibility to teach. It's aged women who are walking with God, filled with the Spirit, to be able to help some other young lady so they can be successful in their own homes. By the way, someone who is messed up can still be filled with the Spirit and teach someone else not to make those same mistakes. So we're not talking about you have to be perfect to teach someone else. The qualification is to walk with God and be filled with the Spirit and teach someone. Notice as it goes on obedient, or sorry, let's go back to good. You know you have to be taught how to be good. You almost think it's a no-brainer, but we live in a world where good is not good anymore. And they need to be taught to be good. Notice this, obedient to their own husbands. It is a curse that has come from the book of Genesis all the way to the fall of man that women want to be in charge and they're going to beat their husbands to death until they, the husbands submit. You know, women have a lot more power over man by submission. Submission makes you dependent. I'm so dependent on my wife, I don't know if I could ever function without her. And she's made me dependent upon her. Not because she takes me with the Bible and beats me up every time I do something wrong. But because she goes and cheats and tells my heavenly father and says, you know what he did to me? And then God gets after me. She's learned the secret. Notice this. To be obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemy. You understand there is a way that a house should function. And if it is not functioning right, the world notices. One of the greatest evidences of a Bible working is a home that's functioning properly. And a home that's not functioning properly, there's the world notices it. The world is looking for a good example to follow. They're not looking for what everyone else is. The, so many people try to be like the world. The world doesn't want a cheap imitation of itself. They want something different. And as much as the far left may yell at it, there are still good things about a good Christian home. And where does this come from? Not from the preacher preaching on Sunday. It is a Holy Spirit filled lady who's learned to walk with God, who teaches someone else the principles found in God. Even if their own home did not turn out the way that it did, mistakes are made. God can still use you to help someone else. So what we're finding here is two principles pretty much. Here's a man who is not a preacher, who is filled with the Spirit, to get the work accomplished in his daily life that needed to be done. At the same time, he is also supposed to teach while he's doing what God has given to do. In the New Testament, we find this thing, same principle. We're to be filled with the Spirit, and at the same time, as we're doing our daily life, being guided by God, directed by God, instructed by God, God's in control, we are not, we're dead to self, that we're also supposed to teach someone else. If I'm a man, I'm supposed to teach a man. If a lady is supposed to teach a lady. Whatever skill that you have, you should be teaching someone else. Pianists should be teaching other pianists. Electricians should be teaching other electricians. Sound people should be teaching other sound people. 
We're supposed to teach the things that God has given to us and teach someone else. But the thing I really want you to get out of here is this idea of being filled with the Spirit. Because ready or not, Monday comes. And you got to face your Monday. I mean, it's fun to have a nice Sunday where you've spent time in church. Sunday school was good. Sunday morning, I'm here at Sunday night. It's wonderful. But then you have to go face the world. You have to go to work. And you deal with people who are not saved. They don't want to hear, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. You have people around you who do not want to hear about the Bible. And you have to interact with them. How do you do that? Being dead to self and being filled with the Spirit. You have a job to do. And you need to do it comfortably and well. But you know that you fall short. Be dead to self, filled with the Spirit. And God gives you the grace, the skill, the knowledge, the know-how to do your job and to work the job to get things done so they can be accomplished. Being filled with the Spirit is not a Sunday morning or a preaching thing. It's not regulated to just a Sunday school class or discipleship. To be filled with the Spirit is a daily life for a Christian in every area of the aspect of your life. You cannot do God's work. But God can do his work through you by the filling of his spirit. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.